So I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to share tonight's lecture with Sharon Prince, the CEO and founder of the Grace Farms Foundation, and who happened to also be my client when we were fortunate enough as my firm, Silman, to be part of the team that designed Grace Farms um, up in New Canaan, Connecticut, which I, I assume everyone on the call knows. If not, uh, visit, please. And um, Ambassador Lou DeBaca, who's the Senior Justice Initiative Advisor to the Grace Farms Foundation, member of the Department of Justice in the Obama administration. I think I got that right, Lou, so correct me if I don't. Um, they're here this evening to discuss the work that the Architecture and Construction Working Group is doing within the Grace Farms Foundation and how we, the collective we on this, this chat and we as an industry, can play a role in eradicating modern slavery in the built environment. And, and so the question right away is, how exactly does that fit into a structures for class? Well, when Sharon first asked me to get involved several years ago, my first reaction was to basically suggest that we, myself and Silman, had no real role in this issue. Um, most of our work is domestic, and the types of stories that I heard before this, I got involved regarding modern slavery in the built environment centered on uh, building site conditions on the other side of the world most notoriously aimed at Zaha Hadid, which a student, which is why I love um, this Cooper already in many ways, which a student in the class last week reminded me, um, took an unfair hit on Zaha as the primary culprit when her male counterparts had been similarly turning a blind eye for just as long, if not longer, uh, to this issue. So what would I, uh, with little real agency to effectuate ch change on a global scale, be able to affect? To that point, what are any of you going to be able to affect and why is this something to cover in a structures class? To answer that, both when Sharon asked tonight and uh, asked both when Sharon first asked and tonight, I thought back and I think back to Bob Silman, the founder of the firm that I'm now senior partner at and his role in the early days of sustainability movement. Bob had no business as a structural engineer sticking his nose into various organizational meetings on green design, and yet he simply saw that he could not not be involved. In the end, he played a seminal role in the green building movement in New York, and what we now take for granted as a key part of de the design discipline, integrated high performance design. Similarly, we're at a point of moral crisis in terms of modern slavery, as Lou and Sharon will lay out. And in the same way that Bob simply decided to get involved and raise awareness, I started from the same place. So over the past two years or so, I've seen Sharon's energy and commitment grow a tiny group into a large group of architects, engineers, builders, lawyers, and other related parties, and more importantly, have seen just how much the supply chain and the materials we build with can be impacted by what we do. Um, I've also discovered how much of the digitalization of our world and collection of big data may allow us to truly understand supply chains in real time and in a real way better than we ever had. And structure is a big part of what goes into any building. Understanding supply chain and layering that variable over your design in the same way you will be asked to layer cost and schedule and resiliency and sustainability will only further enhance your designs and help address the moral portion of the equation. Um, and I believe much more rapidly than it took for green design to bake into the industry. As Sharon replied when we had our first meeting and I mentioned this analogy to the green design movement and I said, you know, look at what's happened over 25 years. Sharon looked me right in the eyes and said, we don't have 25 years, we have five. So she's on a different time frame. Um, having said that, I recognize that this is a vast and vexing issue and that some may even question whether doing good from afar always results in good. Further, the vast majority of people whose livelihood is based on their contribution to the built environment at all levels would say that their role within the industry is too small and that their agency is too limited to foster real change. No matter how impassioned my partners and I are and all the members of the working group may be about the condition of workers around the world, the obstacles are layered and the inertia that pushes against change is real. I can attest that it is nearly impossible to change the overall behavior of industries and owners who are worth significant multiples of our worth. And given the aggressive fee structure of my market, expending effort and goodwill with an owner to push for changes that may increase project costs and complexity is often a difficult calculus to reconcile. How then to catalyze the internal moral belief into industry action? What if for just a moment, we remove the moral imperative from the equation and look at it simply as a technical challenge? Owners, architects, engineers, and builders have consistently used advances in technology as an accelerant to fire up new ideas, new directions, and new purpose. When those advances both reinvigorate design and return value to an owner, entire architectural movements emerge. 
the modern movement, of course, being a private prime example of the shift prompted by new technologies. In this context, we know that in 2020, the ability to track and trace supply chains is only growing stronger, and the movement for offsite or prefab construction in a controlled environment is taking hold. Just these two initiatives would foster more understanding and control of the supply chain, and if embedded with a slave-free filter, would advance us to a generation of ethical design. We therefore are approaching this unwieldy challenge from multiple directions, awareness, advocacy, spec writing, owner engagement, and simply passion. So as we study different structures from around the world and structures for this term, this lecture I hope will allow us to layer on a critical component to the critique of the built environment. And that critique will be built on awareness, interrogation, and debate. We expect tough questions tonight and we are looking for real answers that will ultimately help lift people up. And with that, I wanna turn the rest of the first hour over to Lou and Sharon to give more insight into what is the reality, what, what the reality is at this moment within the built environment. And in addition, as an added bonus, Cooper Union's unique history in combating slavery. And I will say we have about 45 minutes for about 72 slides. This is recorded. And there's a lot of information on the Grace Farms website. So uh, please allow Sharon and Lou to rifle through these slides fairly rapidly and ask any questions you have. Thank you, Lou. Well, thank you, uh, Nat. And um, I wanna say uh, thank you to Cooper Union uh, as well. And I'm gonna thank uh, Sharon in advance because she's uh, got the slide deck. Um, and if we're shooting through this, she's definitely yeah. the, the sharpshooter. So um, if uh, we can uh, go to the first slide um, and we're gonna just yeah. uh, hit you with this. Um, you know, Nat, um, I think pointed out, we have to try to figure out how to remove the moral imperative. And, we're going to talk about the moral imperative as well because it has to be something that um, while at the same time we're going to remove it from the moral imperative we're also going to reintroduce the moral imperative into the economic uh, and uh, societal uh, structures that we're looking at i want to as i always do uh, i teach uh, in history law and architecture at yale um, and uh, i want to uh, not only talk about how Right now we're talking about a $150 billion industry worldwide of this is illegal profits to human traffickers who are enslaving people. They're enslaving 25 million people or so around the world um, in forced labor, forced prostitution, et cetera, um, millions of children. Um, and this is in a context where, as you can see from our little pyramid here, um, a pyramid is the original structure, I guess. Um, as you can see from our pyramid, you know, it is the worst manifestations of a lot of unfairness in the construction industry and a lot of unfairness, frankly, in the global economy, um, where you have, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, a spectrum of labor abuse. Uh, the worst form of that labor abuse uh, is slavery. It's a human rights violation. Uh, it strips people of their human dignity. Um, and it is a crime. Go to the next slide, Sharon. Mm -hmm. So what is modern slavery? Um, there are a number of different definitions, um, and <clears throat> I'm going to give you the, kind of the baseline one. Um, the the uh, folks from uh, the ILO, the folks from the UN, etc. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we're talking about is people who just can't uh, stop working. They can't leave. Um, they've got threats, violence, coercion, etc. They may have been actually brought into the situation um, by promises of a better life. They might have chosen that job. Um, they might have done that job before. This is not the movie Taken. This is not kidnapping. These are people, and I think that's one of the, if you come out of my 10 to 12 minutes on this with only one thing that you should remember, um, it's probably only that statement. These are people. These are people who make good decisions in their life. They decide that they can make better money going and working on a different job site somewhere that they might even have to take out a loan from the loan sharks to be able to get that job so they can take care of their families back home. Um, or it could be that they see somebody who they trust and they're willing to go uh, and uh, work with that person. Now, we're talking job sites at the beginning of this conversation, but I think that as we go farther, we're gonna be bringing in the idea of the supply chain, how it's not simply over there. Uh, it's not simply somewhere else. Um, but where it is, is everywhere. Um, in the construction industry, especially, the State Department, I used to be the ambassador at large to combat trafficking persons. We would put out a report 
uh, every year. And every year we would look at the trafficking and slavery problem in every country in the world. And so you'd get a list. Now, obviously, a lot of people just assume that we were talking about sex trafficking. But when you go back through and you're taught up uh, how uh, this impacts all the different sectors of the economy, you realize um, that this is present everywhere. And it's present especially in the building community, in the construction uh, context. Um, and I think it's really important to think about uh, this. We, you know, we talk about kilns. We talk about smelters. We talk about all of these things that take materials and make them into components that we then make into buildings. We make into structures. We hold things up with them. Um, and yet, we're talking about things that have the human condition baked into them. There's a lot of people who sometimes will act as though the many different um, issues that we're dealing with are separate. And I want to challenge that for a, se for a second. Mary Wollstonecraft, who is the first, one of the first feminists, certainly the first feminist author, in her book or in her essay, A Vindication of the Rights of Women in the late 1700s, she actually said, challenging this idea of the growing global market capitalism, she said, and I quote, is sugar always to be produced by vital blood? And I think that's something that we have to think about. We have to think about why it takes a woman to say that, why it takes somebody uh, who's basically charting out uh, a new social inclusion. Um, but then at the end of the day, what does that mean? Not just for sugar, but what does that mean for bricks? What does that mean for steel? What does that mean for a number of things that we're going to talk about tonight? And at the end of the day, what we're saying and what you'll hear Sharon uh, talking about and what you'll hear me arguing um, to anybody that'll stand still listen to listen long enough, um, is the idea that we are baking in that exploitation. If you look at all of these risks in this slide, these are all things that then end up just like in that sugar, that sugar that has to be made with the blood of the enslaved people in Barbados so that upper class women in Britain can actually then have tea with sugar in it. At the same time, we're also then baking it into our culture and in the built environment we're talking about something that could last for a very, very long time. So this isn't just a one-time thing that happens on some job site some, somewhere far away. This is something that is coming into, through your supply chain, into the projects that you are understandably so proud of. Next slide, please. So I think it's important, um, again, um, you know, to think about this through a gender lens. If you think about these 25 million people around the world, um, it is uh, pretty evenly distributed. What's interesting is that this was seen coming out of the 1995 uh, Beijing Conference on the Status of Women and um, being driven by Secretary Clinton's declaration at that time that women's rights are human rights, um, that a lot of people thought of this as quote unquote trafficking in women and children. And that was a lot of the stuff in the 1990s. I think it's one of the reasons why, frankly, people often want to talk about sex trafficking as opposed to all forms of modern slavery. Um, but one of the things that we've realized, whether it's Mary Wollstonecraft in the 1700s, whether it's the legal reformers in the mid 1900s, or whether it's now, is that not only women's rights are human rights, but women's political and social gains affect everyone, non-women as well. And so these laws that we were able to pass in the year 2000, 20 years ago, in both the US and in the international sphere, um, might have gone through because of a desire to protect women and children, but they, they are protecting non-women. They're protecting non-children as well. What's good for women is good for all humans. And I think that that's one of the things we have to look at when we see this. Now, the construction industry, people might think that that ends up being fueled almost exclusively by men, um, but it isn't. Uh, if you look at the inputs, especially if you look at uh, who is working uh, in uh, textiles, who's working in um, a lot of the, the brick uh, factories, who's working uh, in uh, a lot of even the mines. Um, so there are a lot of uh, situations here where um, our own assumptions about who is a trafficking victim, who's a slavery victim, what are they doing, where are the men versus where are the women, um, I think we have to really challenge those and we have to see again the person. Next slide please. 
So luckily, uh, we can say this, we wouldn't have been able to say this uh, even a few years ago, but uh, now uh, with the almost universal ratification of the United Nations Trafficking Protocol in its 20th year, um, and with laws uh, in place in most parts of the world, um, we, have, we can say that slavery is illegal. Um, slavery, in, especially in places like um, Qatar and, and um, the Emirates, Oman, uh, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, um, hereditary uh, slavery with full legal ownership um, was, has only been illegal for about 45 years. Um, and so you've got people running some of those countries who were raised by people who their parents owned. Um, and that, I think, shows to us just how recent we're talking about. We're not talking about something that's Abe Lincoln or William Wilberforce or Frederick Douglass or George Washington. We're talking about things that happen to people who are still alive. But now it's illegal. Well, what does that mean if it's illegal, yet it still happens? Well, one of the things you have to do after you make something illegal is you then have to go out and have the appropriate laws and the appropriate structures so that you can then enforce compliance. And in the last few years, we've seen that go from what I would call a whack-a-mole theory, which is simply we go out and we arrest anybody who once we know that there's hard evidence that they enslaved someone. Um, that's always cleanup. That's always going out after a tragedy and trying to punish someone who hurt someone else. And so if you look at the Palermo Protocol, the United Nations Trafficking Protocol, it's arranged just like the Clinton administration's um, call for action uh, in the, uh, the late 90s and the United States Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, which is 20 years old this month. Um, it arranges itself around this new and very challenging um, set of principles that I think we're just now getting to. Prosecution, protection, and prevention. The state's responsibility is not just to prosecute the bad actors, the traffickers, the slavers. It's not simply to provide social services to the victims, although a lot of countries still need to work on that. Rather, it's also about prevention. And one of the most effective and one of the most uh, exciting things that we've seen in prevention in the last uh, decade or so is this idea of transparency, uh, this idea of reporting, and with the information that you can gain from that eventually, uh, enforcement. And so you now see um, under the United States Tariff Act, the ability, finally, the old loopholes uh, were taken away uh, under President Obama, and we finally are able to prosecute um, a Tariff Act uh, case against goods that might come into the United States. The French are actually doing it in a little bit more broadly. They're looking at all human rights issues, not simply modern slavery. And the UK and Australia um, are uh, very much looking uh, at this idea of disclosure. Um, so we're seeing a lot of things that are happening. And frankly, if you're a big, uh, if you're working for a big construction firm, if you're working for a, a big engineering firm, uh, you're probably doing business in those particular jurisdictions. And if you aren't, just wait a little bit because the EU and Germany are going to be bringing in uh, their own due diligence laws as well. So Right now, I think what, what we're seeing is it's not simply a moral imperative. It's not simply a gender imperative or a human rights imperative. It's actually quickly becoming a legal imperative. Next. So I think it's important to, under, to understand and, and realize that for now for the last three years, um, all forced labor produced goods are prohibited from importation in the United States. There had been a huge loophole that basically said if it's something that we can't make here and we really want, then we'll let it in. Um, but that was something that we were finally able to get uh, uh, eliminated uh, through the leadership of Senator Ron Wyden. Um, and one of the things that's really heartening uh, is the fact that the Trump administration, rather than throwing this out as a, an Obama priority, um, like frankly, a lot of things uh, were thrown out, um, the, the Trump administration has actually continued this. Just the other day, we ended up seeing uh, the palm oil um, from one of the biggest producers in the world. Um, and palm oil, uh, by and large, is used for um, commercial uh, and cosmetic and uh, food uses. Um, but one of the things that we started looking at when we were diving into it the other day um, was there's a lot of plywood that ends up having palm oil in it. Now, that might not be making it to the United States yet, um, but it's probably making it to the United States in cabinetry 
uh, and other uh, press board materials that are coming out of Southeast Asia. Um, and so even things like palm oil that we might think are in lipstick or we might think are in uh, an additive in corn chips or something like that, palm oil ends up uh, in things that might end up on your job site. Next slide, Sharon. Um, I'm gonna pass it off uh, to Sharon, but um, before I do, one of the things that I wanna say is that in the class that I teach uh, over at Yale, um, this afternoon, we were lucky enough to be, um, to, for me to show a slide much like this one. Um, and because we were joined by uh, one of the folks who really uh, is on the front lines of that enforcement um, uh, effort uh, around the Tariff Act and around training law enforcement uh, around the world to actually make a difference. Um, and I think that it's really important for us since uh, Sharon and I are the ones you get to see uh, tonight, but Rod Katabi, uh, who's our partner in fighting crime, um, you know, was uh, so well received by the students there. And I hope that at some point, uh, Nat, uh, that uh, the folks from uh, Cooper Union will be able to, to have a chance to spend some time uh, with Rod as well. One of the things that both Rod and his counterpart uh, in our class today, who was uh, one of the leading folks in the, the Green Business Council um, back in the early days, uh, one of the things that they uh, made so clear um, is that you really cannot de-link these issues. Uh, you have to have uh, the owners, you have to have the builders, the designers, the standard setters, uh, and industry all have to do their work. But if government isn't actually doing its work, um, there's no reason uh, why anybody should comply with a set of standards that has absolutely no enforcement whatsoever. Um, so part of it, as Rod said today, and this is what I'll leave you with, is trying to figure out what is that happy medium? How do you have enough enforcement um, so that uh, you actually do send a signal uh, that this is a norm, a human rights norm, a gender norm, a, a humanity norm that we will insist on, whether it's in building projects or otherwise, while at the same time not gumming up the entire system so much that you can't have any functioning trade uh, or economic relationships. And so that's one of the things that we're looking for help, frankly, from you and for, from everybody else. Um, and one of the exciting things about bringing that together both the cultural and the policy response uh, is this new project uh, that uh, Sharon's going to take us on a bit of a tour uh, through Design for Freedom. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Lou. And I, you just were able to hear a bit of a mini um, master class from him on the known conditions of slavery, all the nuances in just about 10 minutes, which is pretty remarkable. And then um, it'll play into a lot of what we're going to talk about. We'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards as we um, go through um, an overview of the entire, um, the, the permanent imprint in the building material supply chain. And thank you, Nat. You are my go-to partner on doing the impossible clearly because we, we started with Grace Farms. That was just a warm up. <laughs> so now we're, now we're making strides tonight. You've done so really boldly um, since you said, okay, I, 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 I understand now that, we, you know, that I do have a role to play and I, my pen does um, have a ripple effect as it, uh, you know, it, with humanity and, and, and human uh, rights concerns. So I also want to thank you, uh, Nader, too, um, where you might be if you're, I thought I saw you on here as well. Thank you for allowing us to introduce this topic in this nascent burgeoning form. Um, I now consider you all, now that you're on this call, just so you know, uh, once you know, you can't unknow it, you're all part of it in some way. And um, I'm really eager to hear some of your responses, um, your responses to this, um, this issue and what's already happening. So, Tonight, I am going to clearly ask you to, ha to add human rights as a fundamental criterion in the building material specifications, procurement, as you see that uh, in those that are um, architects on the specification side, procurement, and I want you to be able to envision your buildings as being slave free. You're going to understand the impact is, um, within this next half hour. Uh, just how fraught the supply chain is and how nearly every building has some um, unchecked slavery, at least um, some element of slavery in those buildings. And so I want you to also, um, you know, I also want you to consider 
too, that, um, you know, how this flavor is embedded as we go through it, through your foundations, the curtain walls, the interiors, the whole spectrum. And I want you to understand too, that there is no certification of a slave-free building. It just simply does not exist in our global economy. And that's why this is one of those really um, intractable, very difficult uh, problems, but we are already making, um, we're already making progress. So it's also likely why you came to Cooper Union to help solve these types of problems, right? And um, to build worthy, worthy projects. And I know that you have also been making, I mean, tremendous strides on sustainability, but I also um, know that you can't build innovative, environmentally sustainable buildings at the same time you're exploiting the most vulnerable. So, we're going to get going. And um, how, I assume, and I hope many of you, um, not assume, but I hope many of you have been to Grace Farms. And um, for those of you that um, have been there the last five years, now we've, we've, we've had a number of the classes come to Grace Farms, which we've, we've really, uh, you know, have really enjoyed. And I hope you under, you've seen that it's a new kind of place. And we're also a new kind of foundation that does the work within these spaces with you, with the open, you know, with the public. And that's a big part of being able to, to, with this open architecture, to break down barriers between people and sectors, the public, private, the government sectors, to tackle these pressing humanitarian issues um, that do, uh, then I, and I'll give you a little bit of a, um, that do fall along the lines of, um, of our five initiatives, nature, arts, justice, community, and faith. And, um, and also, uh, it's important to note that our stake in the ground is to end modern day slavery and gender based violence and to create more grace and peace in our local and global communities. And this is a very big, um, you know, this is the, the most important thing uh, that we're doing in terms of bringing together our initiatives, two of them. So, uh, and we think about, so we're in a place of architecture. Um, I went through the whole construction process, uh, there's eight years. Uh, deep, I could see all the pieces coming together, and I also had a commitment to disrupt modern day slavery. So I did not connect the dots though until I was immersed in the issue and also where I could see that sustainability um, was heavily weighted in the, in the sector, but the human rights elements have not been. So what happened is, um, and something else that I, I, I know that you are, uh, very mindful of is that the built environment has a relationship with nature and people, and we're you know we're inextric inextricably linked. The question that I raised, like to you, Nat, and to um, to many others, is your building ethically sourced, slave free, as well as sustainably designed? I couldn't answer that question after I built it once I realized it, and so um, that is the. That is what brought everyone around the table because we couldn't answer that question. So our aim as a group is to eradicate modern day slavery from the built environment by convening an ecosystem of leaders and to create actual outcomes with systemic impact. So that's, um, that was the, the point that we could, we, could, we could do this, right? And we want to illuminate that permanent imprint of slavery that Lou was describing that is, is different than the cup of coffee that you can choose to, um, if you did not know or you realize, oh, this cup of coffee or tea or um, a garment, um, you could, the next cup of coffee, you could, um, you know, you could, you could um, have the next cup of coffee slave free. In the building within construction, once the building is built, it's built. So um, we want to create this whole radical paradigm shift within the built environment. And uh, it's called Design for Freedom. So this whole idea uh, you know, with, within the multi-sector approach we take at Grace Farms is that we bring everyone around the table. So here we are at the Center for Architecture a year ago. And um, that is actually, um, we tried to think about, okay, who, and we're also at Grace Farms. So we have a you know, year long effort and you'll see how that plays out to um, start to move on this. Uh, but first of all, we had to think about who influences a supply chain. So not just who is in the supply chain, but who influences it. So now we have the government uh, legal financing contracts and laws. You have o OPR with the owners. They have a responsibility and a, a lever. 
We also have this, this architectural teams, they, the specifications that you, that you determine, and then um, the construction teams, procurement and documentation, supply chain, we have management companies and, and the certifications on auditing, they have that role to play. Here you are in education and more, we'll talk about more. <laughs> and then, um, and also media activists, artists on awareness, they contribute. So now you think, so many of you are likely architects and um, because that this is also structures, but it's within the architect, it's not all engineers, correct? Within your class, is that correct? Back to mute. <laughs> I think so. So, um, so what I wanted to um, first start off with is- I couldn't get out of mute, yes. Right, so it's within mostly architects in your class, right? Correct, all architects, all, all architects. architects. Okay, so this I think is really important. Um, I know, and it's within the whole architecture um, and design team, the power of design. So this is, um, this is a, a um, quote from Florian and Jing from So Ill. And I think it's super important because it says, sometimes architects and designers forget the design entail, that design entails producing a collection of instructions to rearrange our material world's makeup. We fail to realize that every line a designer or architect draws sets into motion a string of actions that have environmental, social, and ethical repercussions. Today, we cannot ignore this fact anymore. So if every line we draw affects a string of material practices with an ecological impact, it also affects a series of labor practices that impact human rights. Our designs define the labor needed to extract the material from the earth, to the labor to clean it, process it, assemble it, transport it, and to build on it, uh, to build it on a construction site. So that's really powerful, right? I mean, to think about that connective line from your, you know, from your pen. And so, well, from their computer. <laughs> so um, so uh, that, that's from the, archi that's from the, um, the architect side. And then there's also the finance and owners, you know, are owners subsidizing their ROIs with slavery? Likely, yes. So let's talk about the, the, the whole sector itself. It's the largest industrial sector in the world, the most disaggregated and the least modernized at 1% productivity growth rate per year. So it's 13% of the GDP globally. And it, that includes the eco set um, part, you know, that 11% of it's just construction and add a couple more, more percent for the others um, that are affiliated. And then um, 15 trillion is the, uh, the, the global GDP, the US is 840 billion. So, so, we, um, so then the next one is gonna show you, okay, so now this is, this points to also um, the, the, the um, you know, the scale of the industry, but also they're very much um, the whole industry is a big contributor to modern day slavery. And, and so the, um, the thing that's important that, to think about it is that, okay, there's, the buildings remain a largely non-reproducible assemblies. So while there's been some, uh, so I'm trying to look at that too, sorry, go back. Um, there's, there's an increased um, disaggregation due, some of, to some, due to some of the um, you know, waves of change. They have globalization, industrialization, explosion of specialists, the liability crisis, sustainability, even digitization creates opportunities but increases disaggregation. So I thought about that saying, I, I think that dis digitization would help to increase aggregation and, um, but yet the problem is that a lot of these IPDs, the businesses don't, they don't talk to each other. So that also increases disaggregation. And then we think about the, um, the AEC industry, it's highly specialized where relationships between the players are fractured, adversarial, siloed. Uh, it's very well known, right? The tension that exists in the industry. 
And then it's also very opaque between like even working on teams. So you have, um, even with the adoption of BIM, the owner designers and the build teams continue to suffer from broken lines of communication, poor documentation, job site inefficiency, general lack of transparency between the parties. So how can you trust the supply chain to be slave free if we can't even see it, let alone access it? So we are, there's plenty of dilemmas that exist with this disaggregated, very, um, you know, the, the disaggregated and very uh, fractured industry. And yet what I was um, it really heartened to see even actually, I mean, we're in this, this COVID crisis, it's actually um, really, there's a, a turning point that's starting to happen, a disruption opportunity. And this is why, um, and I'll point to, to Nat, you're saying too, like we don't have, uh, as I, I do believe we don't have five, we don't have 20 years to create this change. Five would be doable. And it's actually becoming even more apparent. And I'll explain why five years is really the timeline we want to focus on because it is such a lagging industry, very ripe for, um, for transformation. There's right now at this point, there's 77% increase in R and D spending among top, the top two, 2,500 construction companies since 2013, 50% increase in digitization, and there's new IPDs that are emerging that would talk to each other. And 50% uh, of the market share growth in, um, is happening in permanent uh, modular construction over the last three years. And yes, it's not a big market, it's not as big of market share, so you can say 50%, 50% of a couple percent. But, um, but it's a very interesting study from McKinsey that just came out a couple months ago, and it's called The Next Normal in Construction, How Disruption in Reshaping the World's Largest Ecosystem, um, How Disruption is Reshaping. It's worth, um, worth taking a look at as well. And what I want to show you here is as I was you know, thinking about this even further is, okay, so they, did, they had, took a study and industry leaders are expecting disruption to occur. Now, they're thinking about it occurring where um, they are going to have the highest impact is going to be new production technology, digitization of, um, of, project, of products, new materials technology, new materials technology, that's so super important digitalization of sales channels and um, and so forth. So when do they expect that to happen? Within the next one to five years. So super interesting, right? So now we've got this moment in time where that we're, you know, that there is a, um, a growing, um, um, there's a growing ap um, opportunity for us to, to now add this humanitarian criterion to make sure that they're slave free as these disruptions occur. And while these new product tech, you know, these technologies are occurring and so forth. So this is where we really wanna challenge the industry to not leave out ethical um, buildings, slave free buildings. So how do you know it's being left out? Partly, no one's even asking the question, we know that. When, thinking about this issue, right? So we've got to get this issue on the table. Industry leaders expect shifts to occur in the short term. Where do they expect those to occur? And this is, and this is the top 400 leaders versus the 25 from before. Sustainability, not a surprise. Um, investment in technology and facilities, control of the value chain, customer centricity, consolidation, and so forth. What I don't see on here is the humanitarian, the ethical, um, pursuit. And I'm, the reason I can say this because sustainability is, is an aspiration too, right? It's in some, some ways. And it's caring for the environment. We want to see caring for, you know, for the most vulnerable also on this list. And again, this is looking like it's, um, they think these shifts are going to happen in the next five years. They're also they're, they're increasing spending. This is very ripe and very important for us to get on the agenda. So, um, so the next thing is that um, the material supply chains are opaque, which we talked about and why it's very, there's, there's, and so many, the scale of the, of the materials that are used are voluminous, tens of thousands. You have the possibility of being sourced from 193 countries. We have raw materials that come in 
Um, at, this is 90% of the materials that comprise a building. This is just an estimate of um, you know, four to 600 materials of raw materials that come out to the site and 75 to 100 products. You multiply that out, there's a, um, a lot of, of uh, a wide range of inputs that come into the supply chain. What you see, what we all see is a completed building. And what we have not seen for a very long time is the forced labor. First, that's um, on, we talked to be on the job site, as Lou was mentioning, has, has become, has surfaced. Um, and so that has been uh, recognized. However, the other half of the issue, um, the, build, the forest layers inner building materials, we don't see, and certainly don't see that after it's built. So, the, um, so what can we do? So we want to, we need to investigate the materials. And how are we going to do that? We need to, um, we need data. Well, we don't have it. We need worker activism, don't have it. We need consumer awareness, don't have it. We need, <laughs> we need auditing, very little. And um, criminal investigations, just beginning. Uh, you know, just very little, given the scale, right? So, um, so that needs to happen. Now, we want to now just uh, go into taking a co closer look at what we build with. Now, this is something that um, Lou put together with a number of um, inputs to that we couldn't find anywhere else. We couldn't just say, where, where are the most fraught materials that are in existence right now? There's no list that we could find. Lou um, put that together with our team. We um, pu pulled together both the raw and the um, composite materials that are most fraught. So you can see that some of the materials here are inputs for the composites, and they are obviously, you know, there is pretty widespread throughout the, um, the building. These are the most fraught and are used in most buildings. So let's, talk, let's look at some of the, um, the juxtaposition, which is, set, which is um, we really need to see. So how we can link the buildings to those that are um, indentured and um, forced into labor on the other side of the, and within the whole supply chain too. So if you look at, um, the brick is the most, the most uh, has the highest along with timber, um, expo uh, has the highest um, risk of forced labor. And this image is of a girl uh, making bricks. And then on the right is possibly a school, right? It could be most of the schools. See so many schools are made with bricks. And um, if we don't know where they are coming from, this is a possibility. And then zinc for gutters and roofing. That's another material that's, um, I mean, for uh, gutters and, yeah, and roofing as well. We have gravel and calcium chloride that goes into, you know, into concrete of all sorts. And we also have the other issue of um, environmental issues associated with many of these materials. Steel. So you see um, you know, steel workers here and um, you know, there's just, you know, steel is also uh, essential and um, preferred material as well in the building material supply chain. Sands that are also um, extracted and, um, and uh, put together for glass. And then I put this image here because this is under construction uh, for with at Grace Farms, and you can see some of these materials are right here. Um, you know, we have wood and aluminum, and aluminum is also another one too. But um, steel, uh, zinc, on so we have every material that was just listed. They just put in those in those images, even bricks. And um, I'll explain about the brick. Bricks are actually the star though, they're clean, very clean. And we, yeah, I can explain that a little later. So it was important to us as this uh, revelation actually surfaced. And it was mainly because in talking to leaders of the industry and evaluating projects is with the AIA. And, and so the good news is that they've come on board. So they're not, there's, there's no, um, there's, this is a very, very much a humanitarian effort with everyone linking arms and realizing this is a blind spot. So 
But what happened is they could see the weighting of, of, of our projects, how we're weighting the sustainable, which is excellent, but we need to start bringing in these humanitarian criterion. So, um, so we did this forensics on the, as a working example of Grace Farms. We couldn't do this prior, which is makes me look at that last image and think, okay, I wish that we had been able to do so. We were fortunate because we're lead certified, a lot of the localized um, materials we know um, is bespoke. So it, we have a much, um, I mean, not that, I mean, we just have a higher, higher ability to control those inputs. Um, but we wanted to go ahead and examine, let's examine the roof. So find this really interesting because um, Siami, Joe Mizzi, and Jay Gorman, who is our project manager, were really fantastic. They went back to Zayner, who was our, um, our roof fabricator, and uh, we took a deep dive into the supply chain, and they, they really relished, they really it, um, thought it was an important process for them to do themselves as well, because it can help inform them for the next projects. And so it was, it was also putting Zayner um, on alert, they would be asking them in the future. And they also actually, Zayner was very receptive, and the sum total um, of this was that we found out that um, if, they they were um, the suppliers were receptive, but they need we need to ask these questions before you <laughs> procure the materials. So you can see this is uh, the various roof components, and then this one goes a little deeper. Taking if you just to compare it, okay, we have the roof components, materials, and raw sources, and then we're going to put the go in now and add in the middle the primary material source. And determine okay where did that come from and it was unknown that's where we stopped you couldn't go definitely couldn't get down to the raw materials but you can see just with these roof components uh, the various um, you know um, inputs various alloys even different types of alloys um, and that was on the aluminum side there's still stain there's steel there there's on um, the raw materials this uh, the, the steel ignots um, chemicals recycled content super fascinating but we do know that we, knew, we need to trace these, um, the origins early in the process. And there will be receptivity if you ask. So the, the main thing is to ask the questions. Okay, so steel. Steel, I found um, you know, really fascinating because um, you know, it has a, the tensile strength is high, um, there's low cost. Uh, in terms of the material cost, but it's a very high cost for humans. So these are all the inputs, and it um, is, a, is a preferred um, material. There's many points along there, the, just to get to steel, uh, the supply chain that's not only hazardous conditions, but absolutely a, at risk of forced labor. So, uh, so the one thing that, that is um, interesting too, is that you have, there's many points too, not just with the materials, but you, all the milling that occurs. So you have the mills, you have um, extraction rolling, um, you know, then you're erecting them. So there's a lot of um, service centers too, um, through which 70% of the steel flows from mills to end users are an important pivot point too in the supply chain. So um, I won't, in the second half, I can bore you with my, my uh, fascination with steel, and you can t teach me something as well. But just the whole process um, is, you know, when you're removing carbon and then I mean, adding carbon and then you're removing it, just the, it seems very simple. But what we know is that it's more opaque and complex than one would first imagine, and that's just steel. So let's go into timber. So we also um, looked at timber. So now here's uh, just the, 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 um, the countries that are at risk of forced labor and human trafficking around the, around the globe. And what is important here also is that um, the timber US um, market is 20.65 billion. So it is, um, you know, as you know, timber is the most widely used construction material in the world. And it ranks also though, the fifth largest product at risk of forced labor that's imported into the US. So that's, a, this is, and then you look at it 
98% of all the timber uh, that's brought into the U.S. is used for construction. So there's this is there's an, an imperative, right, to look at this supply chain. So we did do that a little. Um, we did do that, and we're going to be um, doing much more work. Uh, Lou, you mentioned Rod. He's already. We're already working on. Um, there's a lot of transnational organized crime elements. There's many other um, components that go into this, and. Um, and so, and then we also have a nature initiative, so they're naturally combined. So we're going to be really focusing on timber uh, at the source and, and through the supply chain. So this gives you um, the at-risk sawn wood, which is both the, the, the softwoods and the hardwoods. And softwood, as you know, are um, used in, uh, for a lot of constructional elements. But you can see where um, this is just Brazil, Russia, and um, Peru, and they are definitely at risk. Pine in Brazil um, is now exporting to the U.S., I believe, like more than the U.S. output of uh, the southern yellow pine. Again, we can go to these, <laughs> these details in the next part. But um, what's important here is that it's not just an overseas problem. Uh, that the, you can see, and it uh, was reported, that in New York City, the Brooklyn Bridge was recently renovated using wood from sources that are linked to slave labor. So that's like, it's like super surprising, right? Like that's hard to you know, think, okay, how did that, how, does, how did that get by? And it's because we're not, we're not looking. And also Lowe's, the second largest material chain in the US sold uh, floors that were also linked to slave labor. And that was, this was all three years ago. So once you know, you can't unknow it, and now um, we really do have the duty to act. So, and how are we doing on time? I, um, we're going to, how are we doing on time, Nat? We're gonna, we're gonna skip lose close. So I would say five minutes, Sharon, and okay. then we'll give people a break. Okay, that's great. Okay, so this is where you come in. So this is super important. <laughs> so, um, we're creating, I mean, for everybody, um, everybody on the, um, on the call, we're creating a movement for a radical paradigm shift. And we are mobilizing the, the ecosystem of the construction industry. We're looking at, at you know, technology. We want to reduce these, um, you know, close loopholes. And so this is it. So, we're creating this velocity, right? By doing this all at the same time. That's what, there's two things that are happening. We brought the whole ecosystem around the table. So we're not doing this siloed, which is already a siloed industry, right? We're going to, we bring everybody around the table. There's, you would, there's so many fantastic ideas that are very relevant and only, can only really happen because a movement, it can only happen with all of your intelligence because a movement happens from within. You know, you can have all of the, anybody else from the humanit you know, humanitarians and um, activists say that this needs to happen, but it won't happen unless it really is driven by those on the inside, those who are working in this field. That's you. So, um, so that's part of it. So we've now, we've, we have the, the, the full ecosystem represented, but we're also doing a number of things at the same time. So we are, this is where you are in the university. <laughs> Uh, you know, sector. It's not just that it's a class, uh, Nader. I, I really appreciate that you've opened this up because it's it's broader, right? And then we have corporations that are now just coming on board um, to also be a part of this. We have a report uh, that's going to be going out. Uh, we have a report in this website that will be also um, launched, and the whole big part of this will happen in on October 26th. Media that happened last um, year started it with um, the Architects newspaper because um, Bill Menking is the one who started this and also said yes right at the beginning that we need to do something and he's the one who helped bring those around the table. So, um, you know, he really believed in just architecture and there wasn't, there wasn't a pause. He was, he was definitely um, all, you know, really all, all hands on deck to get this um, started. And then um, we also have um, already started a public conversation at Grace Farms. We have that opportunity because we're a public space. We can do that along with this type of, of um, opportunity right now. So building awareness, that's what we're starting to do. Maybe move a little faster. The, the Architects newspaper, I love this image because so everybody's bringing what they have. This is Paul Parvit. We're all using our expertise and our wherewithal. But Architects newspaper has this 
uh, this image that we're going to be using quite a bit because it's like we can think about uh, building green, but there's still that embedded slavery underneath. And then, um, and also um, architecture record, amazing. Like we have, and then there's lots um, on, that are just starting to come on board. But the institutional action steps, this is important because another thing that we're doing, so we have all these things happening, but we're also thinking about a cross sector approach. So it sounds like a lot, but we have a lot of people doing things. So, and ideas emerging. So, where interdisciplinary research is under consideration, test cases, pilot projects, industry pledges we want to add, um, you know, start to add to specifications and so forth. But as a pilot project, just under consideration last uh, last year, Jay Lynn Hernandez came from the NYC e, um, you know, EDC and brought ten of his whole team to Grace Farm to spend the day as a learning session. And now, you know, they. This is fantastic because they do oversee $1.5 billion of assets usually every year. They're always, you know, they have their hands in like 130 projects. So um, they're now thinking they're all informed and they're thinking about how to even start with pilot projects on um, singular, like let's say pilings is one thing to do. Um, they could start with that is more of a singular uh, material. His point here is that we can build socially responsible program, which they do a lot of, but it's how we build is also very, very important. And thinking about you know, where, where the next generation, what they're going to inherit. So again, here we are, and we're going to go to, um, to you. So this is where you come in. This is, we're, we're in the report, we're going to offer, and on the website, ways for people to engage in all the various sectors, but you're in the edu you know, academia, education, and those of you, others on the call. So what can you do? Uh, there's a lot. And so um, modeling, um, anti, uh, you could add anti-slavery criterion to all your modeling, your materials as you start off. You know, you can, this is an epiphany, a very simple thing that I'm sure all of you can also, wait. I'd love to also receive some other ideas that you have that are very pragmatic. But Anne Rowland of FX Collaborative, she is, was um, in the middle of a move, uh, just literally like a month ago. And she said, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reassess and add ethical sourcing disclosures to our libraries. And she created a material library manifesto, which I'm going to show you. Um, and I'll come back to the other things you, you can do. But how simple is this, right? You, um, so how, can we, how can we make informed choices and advocate for better outcomes in, um, in our objective? This manifesto is our action plan for doing so. And we encourage our peers and faculty at universities to create a manifesto too. So this is literally just, just like she's just now uh, wrapping it up and we're gonna put that in the report in the next couple of weeks. So I think this is one of the, you know, more the stronger ideas to, to do something right now because you can start to ask questions from suppliers. And then you can also of course add in these other criteria that's listed below. The bricks, I want to come back to the bricks. We do have bricks at Grace Farms and they're in the, in the um, living room section of the commons, the, the middle volume. And these bricks are, as we did some of the work on the forensics, are Peterson uh, Teagle bricks out of Denmark. And if you are familiar with this firm, but it's the gray clay that they have in Denmark and they are very much, um, they, are, they have control of their full supply chain. And it's fantastic. So we're, yeah, these are there's, there are materials that do control their supply chains, or there's plenty of them. We just have to get to them. So actually, um, back one more. So you're not. So you know you have a couple other things to do, but research. We need research. So research that you can start to pull. To, you know that you would want to um, help to drive these changes. Uh, there's other collaborations, other institutions. We hope to to start pulling that together. Policy, of course is um, to advocate for policy changes, advocate for your own universities to build slave-free with slave-free materials. Just don't let another building happen without having them be slave-free to the greatest extent. And also participate in movement. We're gonna have social media and just get, you know, people, once people know, it, it does help change the landscape. So this is also happening. On, so on the 26th, we have the report on the left, this website. Here's another thing we have, um, so we do have uh, good folks who are, have really um, been working on, they're all now advocates. They've put together this amazing website, very informative and uh, more of a call to action type. Uh, 
all pro bono. So you've had also, you know, a lot of contributions that help to drive this. So the report contributions from 35 within the working group, which is incredible. So we have, again, from the industry, um, along with activists and experts like Lou. So, um, and then we also have these, um, we're going to be, we're in the process of ethically manufacturing face masks. And this is a pro bono design by Shohei Yoshida from Sana. You remember Nat and Peter Miller, formerly of Handel, they both started their own firms and they're working together now on this. And it's something else. So they've created, um, and I can tell you, but it's a silver thread and the silver thread has this antibacterial component to it. And it's reflective, it's also, um, it has this changing landscape. It's, it's really, really, really exciting to see this kind of, my, all this, their minds on this. So part of the, um, you can see again, going through the whole supply chain again, to figure out where we're going to um, be able to create an ethical uh, mask in short order because most things we do are in short order, even though it's a place to slow down at Grace Farms. So, <laughs> um, and now lastly, this is it. Um, these are the universities that you're a part of now um, that have incorporated the Design for Freedom initiative um, and content into their universities. Yale, there's uh, uh, Phil Bernstein, the Associate Dean, and Lou have the first of its kind, um, first of its kind fall class that just started last month, fighting slavery in the building supply chains. And we also had a panel discussion there um, back in January. Parsons, we just had a class with uh, Claire White. So you can see those that are part of the working group, professors are able to also expand this offering. And then Pratt, uh, from Dr. I mean, from uh, well, Dr. Harris, from Harriet Harris to Francis Brunet and others were pulling together um, and launching right after, just three days after the Design for Freedom um, launches this two-part series and it's uh, pretty exciting. UPenn on policy, IIT and IIE on Madrid classes. So you're part of you're part of it, of the um, effort, and I can't wait for the part two. We'll have a break and hear all your questions, right, Nat? Yeah, thank you, Sharon. So you got the overview. I think that the the part two, and we've done this a couple of times, um, these conversations really bring up a lot of the, uh, what we've been talking about and any questions you have. And I think to Nadir's question and to the to the interrogation of this, we look forward to that conversation. So I do want to give you a short break as promised, um, but I also want to make sure we have a decent amount of time for questions. So it's on my iPhone, which is probably made again with some sense of modern slavery as uh, input. Um, it's 710. Why don't we, we'll come back on right at 715 sharp and we'll, we promise you we'll be off by 8 p.m. sharp so you can get to the pre-game, pre-debate uh, television. So we'll be back in five minutes. All right, we're gonna jump back in. I did get one question already. Um, continue to send them as you see fit. And, and Maurizio, um, and here's one from Maurizio, which is great. So um, thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Lou, for the introduction. Um, I am gonna to try to curate this so that we each have, you know, a couple of minutes at the end just to give some finishing thoughts. Um, but I want to uh, jump right into the questions. So. One question that came um, to me uh, from John Moss, one of the professors in the school, um, is really getting into this discussion of, you know, the idea that that construct the construction process is really about assessing risk and allocating risk and defining risk and figuring out who guarantees what. So, I mean, Lou brought up the the challenges internationally. Um, in terms of actually enforcing laws, even if there are laws on the books. Sharon brought up all sorts of um, discussion about knowing, not just knowing that you can't unknow, but knowing what the supply chain is and the real limitations there right now. Um, but the real question is, how do we, and, and Lou and Sharon, and I have some thoughts as well, how do you um, see, how do we see as we start to think about these things and talk within the group, about how those risks are allocated. You talked about Zainer, Sharon, and also for the, the audience. I mean, one of the reasons I appreciate 
Sharon's take on this, and I've become very involved, and I've offered, you know, asked her to present here, is that although Sharon and Lou are obviously very passionate and engaged in this subject and what, what we're up to, um, you know, Sharon took on forensically checking this roof and was very clear that she's sort of putting this out there to the world as a moral imperative, and yet her own building that she invested in and, and built very proudly and is, you know, proud, as proud of it as any building owner I know um, has these dead ends of figuring this out. And if, if you went to Zayner at the beginning of the job, Sharon, if you knew before you did the building and you simply went to Zayner and say, I want you to guarantee that the roof has, you know, no slave uh, labor embedded within it, it's very unlikely that they would come aboard. You wouldn't get Zayner. Um, so I guess I would throw it out to both Lou and Sharon, and it may be too early. I mean, John points that out in his question that he, that he wrote to me. It may be too early in the process to have this conversation, but if we're on a five-year uh, line here, and I think we're already a year and a half in or so, how are you How are you thinking about that? And I have some thoughts, but I'll act as moderator to start. For me? Or sorry, to me? Yeah. Why don't you jump yeah. in? As yeah. So, so the... Um... The questions can lead to an, an answer for clarity along the supply chain. So it can be, so the way I would look at it is like the, the bricks I described, we, they were slave free. Um, so it's just that it's, a, it's the, the magnitude and you can see the complexity of it. At this point, we don't have the tools, so we need the tools. Um, so, but there are, there are um, it's initialized, the questions initialize cleaning the supply chain. And so they said they would have, so that in the case of Zayner, they would have been able to redirect. So it's part, partly it's about redirecting. Who, has, um, who, who does have um, supplier codes of conduct, certain measures in place? And there's plenty, there are some, there's, there are 45 um, certifications. As you know, there's you know, FSC wood, there's uh, certifications that can reduce the, um, the liability and the risk. So we have to use those too. So we have to ask our suppliers to use those. Lou, do you have any thoughts on that from, from your experience, just how this gets policed in the first place and tracked? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a couple of things. I mean, you know, one of the things that we have to look at um, on all of it is which risks are we actually looking to address? Um, you know, there's legal risk, there's reputational risk. There's the risk of today versus the risk of five years from now. Um, things that would be totally um, shielding of a company um, five years from now may, may not. Um, most of our friends in the, the tea, cocoa, and coffee industries are waking up and realizing that their certifications are not going to save them um, because both legislative and uh, lawsuits uh, are coming after them because they went out and they got a certification scheme they could hide behind, um, and then they hid behind it. Um, I think that's one of the biggest risks that we see right now with saying that anything um, is slave free. I was a, a prosecutor for a long time. Um, and you know, as soon as I hear anybody suggest that something might be slave free, it just perks my, my ears right up as far as what I wanna go kick the tires on. Um, because I just don't think that we can say right now. What we can say is whether or not we've addressed risk. What we're doing in the class at Yale right now, um, and we just gave them their assignments um, on Common Ground High School, which is a wonderful, new, extremely um, lauded uh, piece of construction that has uh, a lot of sustainability built into it. It's um, net neutral for at least the, the first 10 years of its life. Um, and that's even with the giant uh, carbon spike of building. Um, and yet, um, the architects uh, that did it, uh, they can tell us absolutely nothing about the forced labor. Um, and the very thing that's making that, that a fancy building for a lot of folks in the industry, those giant glue lamb beams that they can actually trace to the particular part of the forest uh, in uh, Ontario, uh, where they're coming out of, um, they have no idea whether there are a bunch of enslaved guys now going in and doing the reforestation um, in the wake of that sustainable harvest. Um, and the reality, what we're hearing from the Mexican government, what we're hearing from others is that uh, there's an awful lot of Mexicans that are enslaved replanting pine up in otherwise sustainable um, timber. So, but one of the most important things that, we're, that 
has come out of that is that they've given us their specs um, and we're building out uh, genomes of each of the, the products um, so that we can run them uh, through the Freedom Platform, which is a, a tech tool um, that Boeing and uh, Target and a number of other really, really big companies are using to look at risk in their particular products. And to do that, the students are actually having to go through and figure out, okay, what is in you know, a rubber membrane for that roof? What is in um, that glue lamb beam? What is in you know, each of these you know, particular things? One of the things that, that um, I think we were all a little shocked by is um, that folks are the most worried about um, are the components um, and specifically um, worried about the um, worried about the um, solar panels because um, there's so many uh, chemicals and so many different um, things that go into the solar panels. Um, but you know we're going to have to unpack them, and only once we unpack them can we then start doing those forensics and then start asking those questions. And the problem is, yeah, is I the only place that there's a certification are for places and items that already have had a scandal. And so if, and, and everybody certifies to the scandal. So the only certification for forestry products right now is more, um, is more looking at environmental degradation, but even more so looking at um, human rights violations as far as um, you know, blasting out uh, forest communities in the Amazon and things like that. It's not looking at slavery. Um, the folks in the garment industry are looking at, at uh, slavery, but they're only looking at slavery in, in the uh, assembly portion uh, of garment as opposed to upstream as far as the, the cotton inputs. The folks in cocoa are looking at, at slavery, but they're only looking at children in forced labor because that's what the scandal was. So I think that's one of the problems that we have, but it, to me, it's the brilliant thing about Design for Freedom and about the, the Grace Farms vision um, is that it's basically saying, we've got to set up a system that's not just chasing last year's scandal and then trying to put something together that is so walled off that if it's not cocoa, it's not our problem. If it's not blood diamonds, it's not our problem. If it's not something that already had a scandal, it's not our problem. Um, you know, we're asking an awful lot of ourselves and the industry uh, to do that. And I fear that there is going to be uh, greenwashing um, opportunities, let's call it free washing, um, with consultancies that then come in and claim to be able to do a quick and easy certification or an easy fix so that you and your lawyers can run out and throw that up in the short term for your risk avoidance. The problem is there's a lot of other lawyers out there who are better lawyers than I am um, that are simply going to look at that and then wait five years and then go after those companies for failing to meet even the standards that they themselves say that they're following. Yeah, and I think, look, I, I, I think that one of the ways that I've been interested in all these conversations and keep going back and forth, and it's really important, it's so vast and vexing, as I said before, and Sharon sort of went through real quick that checklist of five things and none of which we really have a handle on yet, that you can immediately sort of just throw up your hands and say, forget it. And again, I keep going back to the early sustainability movement, but I also, I, what, what resonates with me, again, is, is trying to find ways to create the disrupted market where this will have a place and, and create ways of building that foster um, building slave-free. So creating technological advances, and, and I am not, those who know me and have been in my class or been in projects, I am not... I like the idea of modular construction. I think there's some real promise, but I'm not an acolyte like some. I'm not preaching modular everywhere. Um, and so I'm not here just saying that's going to solve it all because you still have all the constituents that go into modular. But I do think that there are moments when we as an industry can get together and say, we're just going to decide to do this. Um, Andy Clemmer made that comment on the chat. And when we do very often, we can, we can create new, new, econo new economies and new ways of looking at it. one of the most promising things, one of the most interesting conversations we had to the point of architecture and building is when Sharon asked Siami to do that retroactive study of the roof. One of the things you see is that we've allowed ourselves in an industry, and I will sound a little preachy here, 
to make everything so friggin' complicated because we can. So because we can draw it in Rhino or, or um, Revit or whatever, and we can put 53 components into the roof, and that's what we're told is needed, we put 53 components in the roof. When you try to reverse engineer and figure out where all those components come from and you make that part of the project, you may end up finding that that restraint really makes for a better project. And suddenly you build a roof again out of five components that you know about, and it's actually a better roof at the end of the day. And I think, sorry, my, my dog agrees. I think that structurally, there's, there's always the discussion of the most sustainable building is one you save. And certainly there might be enforced labor baked into the original construction, but, but at least dissipating and amortizing that over a long period of time. There's a lot of parallels where you say, if you can make a really uh, elegant design, you can then trace the roots better. And so that vastness that vexes a lot of people, we have a responsibility just to sort of co corral that vastness as well when we look at these projects. I wanna ask, there are a couple other questions which are great and I wanna ask them, but I don't wanna run out of time and I don't wanna put you on the spot, but, but Nadir, I don't know if you want to jump in or ask any direct questions, or I know you had an interest in making sure that we dug into some of this. So I want to make sure I just ask you if, if you have any thoughts that you want to share or ask. Look, um, I'm mindful of the audience here. And, and I would say that, you know, the students um, in, in many ways are in a design moment where they're speculating on ideas uh, whose material consequences are way down the road. Uh, and I'm super interested in the way that you presented this because in a way we're at a kind of mom a historical moment where you're trying to pull out, uh, put out fires as it were, because we just don't have enough data and information about it. Well, what I'm, what I'm interested in is how you, uh, establish a design consciousness from the perspective of your research uh, that in a way inserts itself into the design studio um, uh, and so that you turn the traditional course of design which is usually conceptual and abstract in the beginning and material and concrete at the end you turn that uh, on its head yeah, and I, it's interesting. There was an early meeting. I will say, because I, I am, as you know, more a practitioner than, than an academic, but I, I really enjoy these conversations. So one of the early conversations, and I think Florian was at that workshop, was sort of exactly that question. How do we get designers on board thinking about this? And, and how do we change that design paradigm and thinking about the materials up front? One of them was overly simplistic and sort of the blunt object approach, but it it resonated with a lot of people in the room, as I remember. And Pratt was at that point, I think we were already engaged in a conversation with Pratt about potentially looking at ways to embed this in their new building um, as, a, as an initiative. One of the things we thought about is could we come up with sort of, you know, the, the 12 worst offenders um, as materials and remove them from the palette, sort of say to the design competitors, you have an opportunity to design this amazing building for Pratt at some very large budget that's going to be great for your practice, but you don't get to use rubber or brick or, you know, and, and I, I really felt, and a lot, I think if I remember correctly, a lot of the architects in the room felt that there'd actually be an energy generated by that in the design process that architects would look at that as a challenge that, that they'd appreciate, you know, and I, I think it would, you know, you, you, there's always the pitfall, you, you know, that, that you could say no brick or no rubber, but there's rubber gaskets in something that you can't track entirely. But the general idea that we're going to try to do this um, was out there. But, and that pivots a little bit to another question that came up. And, I, and Sharon or Lou could jump in to Nadir's question as well. But, but it pivots to the bigger question that, that I've been asked. And I want Lou and Sharon to opine on, which is the, the sort of at times the elephant in the room to this conversation, which is, you know, I have very strong feelings that we, we have an obligation to do what we can to end modern slavery around the world. 
I think there are a number of people who have questioned, you know, is that our right? And, and while we judge in the developed world that somebody's enslaved, and I think that's a fairly clear definition, can we guarantee that if we put all brick makers out of business, that that's necessarily going to lead to better lives down the road? So again, my, my constant toggle back is often this idea of creating markets that are able to thrive slave free and show owners of those companies who think the only way they can get a product to market at a right price is with slave labor so that somehow we convince them to pivot away from slave labor and yet still produce materials. It's a, it's an aspiration. I agree. It's out there, but I, I, I think we can still embed that concern within the discussion and not just assume we're putting all slave owning brick brick makers out of business um, and therefore leaving people behind. I don't, Sharon Lou, there's sort of two questions in that, but I wanted to turn it back over a, to you. That was a fiery one. I know that um, <laughs> that Lou's gonna. I'll let oh, Lou. Yeah, that's good. I know that's a good fiery one. I like that. Okay, Lou, you can start, and I'll I'll wrap on that one. All right. Um, well, a couple of things. I mean, you know, one of the things that I um, always think that we need to do is to the to the degree possible. Let's you know take this the the uh, standards and the the broader human rights norms and then take the science and put the two together. And what the science is telling us um, with the project that um, the folks over at University of Nottingham are doing with those little tiny satellites that they've got buzzing around the world um, is um, they actually are showing increased capacity and in increased production uh, from non-slave uh, brick kilns in the brick belt in Pakistan and, and Northern India um, when they come in and clean up hereditary debt bondage in village A, you end up seeing actually be better uh, brick output um, that's happening, not just in village A, but also in village B. Um, it takes time and it, and it takes, I think, uh, something that is not the simplistic. Uh, what we saw with our friend Ben Skinner when he was doing uh, work in Bangladesh in the leather industry, is the first thing that uh, Michael Kors and all those guys wanted to do was to pull their buy and say, well, we're just not gonna buy leather from here anymore. Um, and that would have done exactly what you're suggesting, um, Matt, as far as uh, just basically putting uh, almost a million people in the leather industry in that part of Bangladesh uh, out of business. Um, and so uh, Transparentum, who had uncovered uh, the problems in the first place, they threw themselves in front of the retailers and said, no, that's not about canceling your orders. It's about getting in there uh, and having a unified, uh, a unified voice. But this displacement effect, frankly, it's something that's been argued uh, for a long time. Um, it's something that was argued uh, in the late uh, 17 and early 1800s um, by wealthy British industrialists who did not want, and aristocrats uh, who did not want to have slavery abolished in the empire. Um, and uh, it's something that I think constantly is used for ill. But just because it's used for ill doesn't mean that there might be might not be some kind of a kernel of truth as far as displacement is concerned. So I think we always have to be mindful uh, of that. But the bigger overlapping uh, question and the, the concern that, that you raised as far as, you know, is this a Western conceit that's being imposed? This is Article 4 of the Universal Declaration of Rights. Every country in the, United, in the, the world, uh, every country in the United Nations uh, had uh, signed on to this uh, by 1949. Uh, this is something that the, the, the people of the world have agreed upon. And the idea that the idea that you should only be able to aspire to a slavery building if it is going to be built by a Stark architect and whatever you whatever cute name you guys use for the star engineers of the world, star engineer, um, we should not be building bespoke slavery free products. Just like we should not say that only rich white communities should be able to have environmentally friendly buildings that are then subsidized by the downstream effects on the minority communities that are next to the power plant um, or are next to where the effluent from uh, the solar panels are being dumped into the river. I think it's capturing those externalities, uh, but also insisting on freedom. Like my, my community, the Mexican community in the United States, you know, we got colonized. Um, and we got colonized by an invading U.S. Army that took all of our land away. Um, and horrible things have happened 
over the last 150 years um, in New Mexico. Uh, and yet, nobody in my family would say that we should still have the right to kidnap Indian children and have them work as servants in our houses. Um, that wasn't an American idea. That wasn't a Western idea. That was actually just modernity. And it was something that we shouldn't have been doing in the first place. Um, and I think that's something that we have to think about is that it wasn't the New Mexican and Northern Mexican elites being inconvenienced by some American cultural or legal practice. It was the New Mexican and Northern Mexican indigenous people and working class people who were being freed from slavery by that. So a lot of times you see that argument now that's uh, kind of thrown against, oh, that's a Western conceit, ends up being thrown at the West by some of the elites uh, who are uh, looking to sustain their particular place vis-a-vis -vis the folks uh, from the working class uh, and excluded communities. Um, but I think that it's something that we do have to be thinking about um, is how do we balance those things and how do we go slow enough that communities actually see themselves in this freedom freedom ethos. Yeah, and I, to that point, I want to um, combine sort of two questions that came up. I think they're very good ones. One is asked by one of my students, is you know or or brought up as a point is that um you know when you talk when sharon when you spoke about and this is another issue building off of what lou just said when we talk about zayner and peterson these are very high-end products and mm -hmm. and they can they occupy a space in the market where you could challenge them and they would probably have the ability within their cost structure to make these changes or to to really think about this in a thoughtful and real way um, and and yet a lot of what gets built is in the lower ends of the industry where that cost margin is is really under a lot of pressure um, not to again like Lou said it shouldn't be enough pressure to force anyone to put anyone into slavery but that's the reality of the world we're in another of the questions that was asked um, is this idea of you know what comes first and I think you know to the point of how do we pressure the even the lowest and producers to consider this and to change. Um, and, and how do we do that, chicken and egg? And you sort of said, like, we're doing it all at once. Um, and so I think that is, is part of that discussion is that all at once. And I don't know, Sharon, if you want to elaborate on that in terms of, you know, we've talked a lot about Zayner, Peterson, these other companies, but I know as a group, we've also discussed the fact that a lot of the market's driven by firms that have no real name. Oh, absolutely. And we also have people on the, um, the working group who's pri they're primarily um, working on projects that have um, that are community projects that have um, they use standardized materials that don't have much control of their supply chains. Uh, Patricia Saldana, who's uh, taught at IIT and IE about this matter is particularly um, attuned to that. And so we've been having those kinds of conversations. We do have that representation in the, in the working group and also just because everyone can't, you know, we all, you know, we, we need to make this a, the norm and it can only be the norm if it's within the, the you, know, to, you know, standard deviation from the middle. So we've got, we've got to really, um, the focus is there. The possibilities, as I, I was demonstrating, that it can be done um, how you do that to scale is another thing, um, but you still have to ask the questions in between. And there's other indicators that I'm talking about, not only within disrupt, you know, disrupting the, the whole industry right now, how we can apply the, the question. The thing is right now, are we going to stand up and ask for this humanitarian criterion to be added to all of the advancements that are going to be happening in the next five years? That's what I'm asking for. So that means that it doesn't, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean it's going to be conclusive, but we can add criterion to what's already in place. That's one. And then we also know there's an appetite for sustainable and ethically sourced materials. There's um, studies that show you'll pay um, for people that, again, there's the building is not a small, uh, it's, not, it's not a cup of coffee, but it's for those that, um, that we, you know, how, how can we transfer that, um, the mindset that you will pay two to 10% more for something that you know is clean. And that's how sustainable products you know, began. It's just that it has to start, we need for it to start, and then it has to, then it'll have a waterfall effect, just like Lee did, right? There's now these second and third order um, uh, results, you know, from having, you now you can buy, anybody can buy an LED light, you know, <laughs> but it, originally it was expensive. I remember getting one of the first um, LED lights on the, uh, for the five years ago, 
for, you know, on the, um, in a sanctuary for stage lighting is one of the, like the, the first in white and so whatever, but you know, I mean, like it's going to, they're, they're all, um, you know, there's, there's second, third order effects by leading with the, those that do have the muscle to make those changes at a, at a, at a high level. Um, and also with big projects, because then you have more leverage and we need to get to developers and we need to, that still have an ethical mindset. So it's, it's not that it's different than, um, it's, it's not a, it's, it's pretty, it's a, it's a zero one game. It's not, there's not a gray area to slavery, you know? Yeah. And I think, I, I think one of the things we've talked about quite a bit, again, it's, it's how do we move the markets? And again, I keep going back to this idea of, you know, that I do think there is, and we've talked about it in class and, you know, we, we sort of pat ourselves on the back too, too, uh, too vigorously when we can integrate a duct running through a beam um, because we've made this digital mastery out of a 3D model. You know, the industry itself, the reality is we are incredibly backwards relative to other industries and digitization. And, and we're catching up, we're getting there. But, but to the point that Sharon made, there's this incredible moment where the industry is disruptable. We do have a model in sustainability where you look back 25 years ago, and I wasn't there. I don't know if the conversation was, you know, that, that we would somehow put a bunch of, you know, uh, uh, oil tank makers out of business or something, and that might be a problem. Um, but we can also look at that 25-year history and see that whole markets were moved and grew up around this recognition and awareness. So, so I do think it's a little bit chicken and egg. We've talked a lot. The nice thing about this group is we have connections with some big market movers. So there has been discussions. Can you get, you know, venture capital money into creating industries and production uh, methods that can, can control supply chains and really make sure they're designing and see it as a market opportunity um, to invest in. You know, the, the moral clarity should be there, but to show them the, the fact that they might have a market might motivate them even further. I think also we're going to owners, as, as Sharon mentioned, there was talk of going to Amazon and saying, okay, you're about to build whatever it is, 8 billion square feet of virus-free warehouses or whatever they're up to next. Can you do it in a slave-free way? And I think part of the benefit that we're trying to get at is we're not saying to you, to, to, to lose point, we don't want to create greenwashing where we make it so strict that it has a, has a perverse impact and people just sort of try to pretend that they're doing it. We want to do it for real. So we, we try to create a conversation and metrics that's about aspirations and getting what we, can done, what we can get done done and not simply saying to them, we're going to slap a plaque on your building if you, you know, prove out X, Y, and Z, which we know is impossible to prove right now. But it's more getting people on board that they're going to work hard on awareness um, within the process. So um, can I add to that I, one? Second yeah. Yep. On that, Matt. Um, yeah, yeah. Andy Clemmer is on, and I see his comments. Do you, I know you're moderating, but I just have a question. Yeah. Um, but do do you think that um, because I know Andy just from our conversations has been already introducing this topic with owners? Um, do you think it's appropriate to see so ask him? Um, yeah. Just ask uh, Andy. Hi. <laughs> Can you turn? Jump in, Andy. Yes. Andy Clemmer is the is client rep par excellence, and he was the client representative for Grace Farms, among many other projects, you know. <laughs> right. So just to, yeah, I know you're introducing this topic now because you're just taking it up. So can can you give us some color, some you know, some uh, responses you're receiving? Can you hear me? Has me as yeah. yep. 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 wow. magical magical Zoom. Um, what was your question? I, what is the response of people that you, because you're saying it will cost more, the slave um, free material will cost more, but you've already, so you've already, um, these are some of the dilemmas, right? Um, and then you have projects, you're, you know, that you're, you're on time and on, on budget. And that's what you're, you're, exactly. So, so how do you, how do you put this? Um, it was a response, Ben, given that um, the conundrum of, you know, wanting to be on time and yet it might cost more. And what is their receptivity knowing this issue? I think that people can't, People are so unaware of this issue. They're so distant from it that they don't, they don't, they're not reacting to it when they buy a building. And you're forcing them to react it with your great statement, which is, is once you know it, you can't unknow it. So there's, it's not even a negotiation. 
at that point. So we're just beginning, I'm saying that very confidently, but we're just beginning to introduce this to projects that are in the middle stage. The first that we are going to introduce it to were put off because of COVID, but um, I can't imagine having a long argument with anybody about this because there's, there's just no one can morally say, oh, but we need to save this money. People are raising a hundred million dollars to put up a building. The slave labor portion that they're saving is not going to be the thing that makes the building happen or not happen. So I think it's a, it's an overlooked thing that you're not allowing it to be overlooked any longer. And we just have to get it out there. And I can't imagine anybody embarrassing themselves by saying no. Yeah, no, I think. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and 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 to that point, though, and I appreciate Sharon and what you're saying also about the owners, because one of the questions that was also brought up is there are a number of firms that have made public statements and stuck by them. I mean, I'm saying this in an honorable way, not not a greenwashing way, about not working in certain countries that have have human rights violations and so on. So firms might say, I will not work in Saudi Arabia or others. And I don't mean to, sorry, pick on Saudi Arabia, but there's, that came up in the last three or four years, obviously. Um, and, and I think the question was asked, you know, are there firms also out there that would take a similar stand, if I'm reading the question correctly? Um, and, and I think, again, that was part of my intro, too. One of the things that, that I appreciate about the working group is the idea of hitting it from all different angles, because I do feel that we as designers, and I'm not saying this as a martyr, I'm just saying as reality, have less agency as individuals. That, that if, if I wake up one morning and say, I will not do any of this, it's not to cop out or not to say I'm just in it for the money, but there are plenty of other competitors that'll say, fine, we'll do it instead. Um, and so my voice gets diminished at some point. I mean, it's a conversation, frankly, we're having very, very, I hope we're going to have, and we've been having internally, within my own office about, you know, um, doing work that promotes um, anti-racist uh, initiatives and, and anti-racism. And how do you choose those projects? And, and it's, always, it's a little bit of a balancing point of, are you in the industry enough to have a voice? And if you back away too much, do you lose the voice to make change? How do you balance that? So I think part of what we've been discussing in all of this, and the reason, again, I appreciate it, is it's not just architects and engineers getting together in a room and saying, this group is going to boycott X. It's not just owners saying, we'll dictate this. It's not just builders saying, we'll take care of the supply chain or spec writers saying, we'll write into specs. It's all of us at the same time trying to aggregate and one plus one plus one plus one equals 10 rather than each of us taking individual action. And I think, I think that's the only way it's gonna work. I don't see it working if individuals just decide to stand up and say no. Yeah, and Matt, one of the things that we see is that, um, you know, while we in Design for Freedom are very focused on the materials supply chain, um, you know, the labor supply chain um, is, as you said in your topper, you know, it's where people notice this and it's where the exploitation is the most, um, is the most obvious. You know, all of those labor supply chains that you think of when you think about modern slavery and on the mega projects, the first thing that gets built there is not even the site prep. The first thing that gets built is extensive dormitory and man camps. Um, you know, somebody is designing those. Um, so we, you know, we, we shouldn't just think, you know, oh, there's build, there's design, there's materials, there's job site. Um, so one of the things we see, and, you know, I think it's, it, we've had, conversations with them um, aligning Design for Freedom uh, with uh, this other group, uh, Building Responsibly, which is very much job site focused. Um, but you're talking about folks who are coming together at a pre-competitive stage so that they can try to have something so that you won't end up getting, especially on the mega projects, you won't end up having clients shopping around to somebody who will undercut everybody else. So you've got your Bechtel's floor, Jacobs, Multiplex, Vinci, you know, et cetera. You know, they are all come to, coming together and having a set of, of standards. And those guys are such big movers uh, in that segment of the market. Um, you know, if you're gonna build a huge dam, you know, a, a, over the biggest river in your country, you're gonna have to go to one of those guys. Um, you know, so I think that one of the things that's interesting for us as far as looking at whether it's uh, commercial um, construction or or other 
um, projects is how can we end up uh, coming up with modeling um, kind of like what they're doing as far as modeling on the, the big job sites uh, so that we can end up uh, having these standards that everybody can look at and say, yeah, that's something that actually does work. And maybe that's something that I can take part of into my hundred person firm or into my um, you know, firm that's only gonna build you know, eight things a year uh, or what have you. You know, that's typically how it works is the big guys uh, end up doing something, show that it's possible. Um, and just like as Sharon said, you know, the, the uh, fancy light fixture of today is, you know, coming to a suburb near you 10 years from now. Yeah, so I want to I want to be true to my engineering roots and be very precise. And I know my students have a four hour studio before they log on to my class. Um, it's definitely a daunting six hour period of time. So I do want to try to wrap it up. There have been great questions. Thank you all. I want to give Sharon and Lou and uh, an opportunity just to say a few last words. Um, I would I would just end by saying a um, thank you to Nadir and. Um, for indulging me on this and for opening to the public, Maurizio for his help and, and Liz, Elizabeth O'Donnell for her support on this. Um, I, and I really appreciate um, Lou and Sharon coming in here. I do think that, you know, there's, there's amazing opportunities to, if, if nothing else, if, if, you know, the, you feel that it's just too daunting to get your head around or you know that 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 morality has no place in design, even the the far end of the bell curve. I would simply suggest that there is an awesome opportunity to enliven your designs by bringing this variable in and and considering it as you work through your designs. Try that first, and we'll move on from there. I think is is really an awesome opportunity. Um, and, Matt, can and, I ask a question yeah. for you, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Absolutely. I, I and I hope it doesn't extend it for too long, but I, no. the questions and the, the themes that uh, both Luis and Sharon bring up are, are so daunting in many ways that they, um, far from uh, relinquishing and, and standing up for the responsibilities that architects have to um, confront, uh, it's often the case that we are on the receiving end of many policies and uh, uh, forms of governance uh, uh, that we're at the end of the supply chain in, in many ways. So yeah. my question has to do uh, with the relationship between democratic practices as a form of governance and capitalism, which has a completely different goal. Uh, and much of the discussion tonight revol revolves around uh, the tacit acceptance uh, about all of the business practices that we all comply with today. Uh, and notions of profit and notions of uh, competition that have inbuilt in them a, a form of structural racism, if you like, or a form of structural inequity. And, and so, so my question to Lisa and Sharon is, do you see, well, and I, not, I would never sit here and try to critique Grace Farms uh, as a kind of rarefied project. Uh, I'd actually rather say it is a rarefied project, um, but that doesn't make it a flaw. How can we not rely on symbolic projects to lead the path to this, but would you, do you think there is even a path towards a slow evolution towards equity, or do you think that, uh, the, that we need to be fighting for a form of governance that altogether overthrows what we're looking at right now in the United States. I, I, I'm mindful of the uh, debates tonight. I'm mindful of the elections, uh, but precisely because uh, the name that socialism has been given in, in the US, precisely because of the ways in which questions of equity have been distorted, I want to see, do you see this as a gray zone or do you see some fundamental paradigmatic shifts that need to occur? Sharon, if you could go first, I'm, I've got some thoughts, but I'm okay. still formulating them. <laughs> okay, it's a very, very, it's a, it's a really good question because at the essence, uh, there's two things, there's three things. One, um, for Grace Farms, we did not set out to create 
a rarefied project. We actually tried to infuse the values. The whole idea is start with the idea that space can communicate. So, and, and yes, we're in a rarefied area of Connecticut. And I, from the very get-go, said I recognize that. Um, however, the idea is to create a more diverse society. And where are you going to do that? It's like we're, we've had the, 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 um, the number of opportunities we've had in our area that's both local and global to address um, inequities is very many. Even Kendi, now we had him four years ago at Grace Farms to speak on these things in a place that was probably the first time ever that kind of conversation. So we're equipped to be a platform to create, to have these difficult decisions, to wrestle with these kinds of um, very thorny subjects. And the idea is to create more parity in the world. You know, I'm, I'm very interested in creating gender parity and also racial parity and, and so forth. But, um, but, and so the, our team, so you can do that. You can do it by design for the, you know, it's, it's part of like how we do things and who you do that with. So, um, so like all the team, the working group is half, it's not that there's not enough women architects. I mean, they're, they're definitely not um, that are in these, there's no, there's not parity, but you can create it because I created it on our team. You know what I mean? Like you can, you can, you can shoot, like we can start to move the needle by our actions. And so like in terms of, um, I'm not, I can let Lou um, speak to the capitalism versus socialism and those kinds of concepts and how that plays in, but it's more about um, this point. The point of this is to think about the, the who, who is on the other, you know, who. So, I mean, I, but I think about that all the time. So I think about trying to create the parity in what we do. Um, the working group teams, the, I mean, I, I ask, and, and Annie can, you know, can, can attest, but like part of the criterion was your ethics, you know, also. So it's not just whether I'm, you know, uh, like what my demographics are, it's just more about what are your ethics. And so we're trying to raise and surface ethics and parity. So, um, so we have Darren Walker um, on, the, on this working group too. He has no time, or there's a lot of people who don't know time, but our conversations have been around, okay, so why was it, I care, because we looked at each other and said, I care about, I care about equity, about a diverse, um, and trying to increase that amount of equity in the world. He does, obviously, but why do we both build without a slave? Why do we both miss that? You know, so the thing is, he said, nobody, like everybody knows how committee is, I, our stake in the grounds in modern day slavery, and yet nobody from the profession that we, are, I'm not an architect, I'm not, you know, I had never even built anything before, right? So nevertheless, a, a residential home. So you needed, so, so this is where the expertise and the, to, to create a level of playing field is that we have to, we have to start to raise the, the who and, and, and start to create that. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be left out. We can create ourselves. I mean, and I think, I want to, so, uh, sorry to interrupt, Sharon. But I don't know if that is, it's, it's probably a, a side bit. I mean, but also it's like, so he, has, so he is probably a sidebar. But anyway, um, Nate, it's a, such a good, such a good question though. Well, and I want Lou to, I think it's a great question to lead into to Lou sort of some finishing thoughts. I mean, I, I, Nadir, all I will say to you is I appreciate the, the sort of spotlighting of that because I will admit that, that I am somebody who probably skips way too fast to the reality I'm in, engaged in and and you know my voice has often been one to say okay fine let's just figure out a way to convince people that they're going to make a lot of money and then we'll get the moral and ethical stuff done but that is a sort of conceit um probably just scarred from you know childhood of growing up in and around cooper union and being defeated all the time and finding the world i woke up in uh you know 50 years later so i i agree that 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 i'm actually one who does believe that that Part of the big paradigm shift to all of this would be systemic change in certain ways. And, and, but I still feel like if we can do everything we can to till the soil and set it up so that if that actually happened, we'd be ready for the opportunity, it's worth it. It's sort of the way I look at it before waiting for that change. And, and I want, I mean, Lou, can you, you want to, you want to wrap it up in a, uh, in yeah, a way that inspires us all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I want to, Nat, I want to encourage you, you to give yourself a, a lot more credit than that. I mean, I think by pushing it, you are making the change. Um, one of the things that we see from the late 1700s um, is that, especially in England, you know, you end up having these ideas of gender and sentiment and race 
and commerce and international trade, they all come together in the slave trade debates. And the slave trade debates are really then pushing men and women, especially in, in England, to reconsider their relationship to the world of goods, their world, of, and to think about a national economy based on standards of humanity rather than simply profit and loss. Now, obviously they then went out and grabbed the rest of the world as far as their empire is concerned. So it didn't necessarily take, but what you have is 200 years later, that intellectual tradition, that's where that was built, where we're talking about this idea of alternative value propositions. It was because having the abolitionist conversation to begin with forced the introduction of a values conversation into the idea of global capital. And I think that there's two people who I wanna, you know, I, I always say that we have to think about people. And I think I said that earlier tonight, um, it's all about the people. Um, Thomas Clarkson um, was a poor kid from England who went to Oxford because he had somebody in his family um, back before they lost all their money who had been there. And he went there um, on a scholarship that basically required him to be a servant to all of his rich friends. Um, and yet, because he submitted an essay in Latin on the slave trade, he won the most prestigious prize at, at Cambridge, sorry, not uh, Oxford. Um, and it ended up paying for his education. A few years later, a meeting that he had in his print shop in London with 11 other people, 12 people basically said, we should outlaw slavery. The very thing that this entire empire is built upon, the very thing that fuels this entire empire and that takes us all over the world, we should, we should make that illegal. 12 people. And mm -hmm. two of them were former African slaves themselves and the others weren't. But 12 people and they dared to do that. And they then teed up that conversation that started people like Mary Wollstonecraft to talk about gender, that started people talking about alternative value propositions. And that eventually made it so that the United Kingdom was willing to spend 40% of its GDP to blockade the slave routes between the United, between the, uh, the Americas and Africa. We lose 17,000 sailors over those years. That is how you end up taking an idea to a, a social movement to blood, iron, and steel of a, of a country that is then willing to actually die for the idea of freedom. Mm -hmm. It was probably one of the most ridiculous business cases and it was probably one of the most ridiculous diplomatic cases. And yet, interestingly enough, what it did is it made the British Empire have, for all of its flaws, it had a moral basis that differentiated itself from everybody else in its time period. Now, it maybe doesn't look quite that way, but that they were willing to lose 20,000 people and 40% of their GDP to abolish slavery, that was a big deal. And it had that other benefit that they then basically ended up ruling the world for a hundred years after that. Um, I want to say that because Thomas Clarkson has somebody like him, very much like him in the United States. Um, somebody who was an indentured servant, um, who was an apprentice, um, who was such a talent that even the person to whom he was apprenticed then immediately set him up in business as soon as he was old enough, um, that he ended up basically inventing modernity um, through the invention of rolling stock, um, locomotives, rail, uh, and uh, his backing of the transatlantic cable. Um, and I'm talking about Cooper. Mm -hmm. The reason that we are all here, the reason that you and the class are here, the reason that, that for more than 100 years, uh, 150 years after his death, uh, people were able to attend this school without any uh, money at all. Uh, people like Edison and Carnegie and others who were inspired um, and were given a shot because of this guy. Uh, and he was somebody who ended up, right now we would call him a child laborer because of how he was, um, how he was employed when he was in his teens. An indentured child servant who then goes on to change the world. When I say change the world, I mean, and 
It's so timely for tonight. This is where Abraham Lincoln gives the House Divided speech. This is the person who writes the checks for the abolitionist movement, because even in his old age, Cooper understood that what was happening to African Americans in the South was basically something that, that he understood because of his own humanity. And I think that's something that's a challenge for me, it's a challenge I hope for all of you, is how do we find our inner Clarkson? How do we find our inner Cooper? It's not just about studying something for the sake of studying it, it's what are we gonna to do to go out in the world and make that walk towards freedom? All right, thank you, uh, Lou and Sharon. Thank you, Nadir. And uh, that's a nice way to end it. Exactly. So I'll let you all, I'll let you all get over to your uh, cable news networks or avoid the debate altogether, which some of us may do at this point, because I'm not sure we're changing anything under any of this, but it's worth uh, setting up for. Thank you all again. <laughs>